Welcome, welcome, welcome to Reignite Yourself, the Visual Effects Society's and Quebec Film and Television Council's mental health series featuring conversations with professionals from the entertainment industry and mental health specialists. I'm Philip Wolf, co-chair of the VS Health and Wellbeing Committee and will be your host. This series has been created to empower yourselves, ourselves, the visual effects and animation professionals with tools, insights and facts about our mental health. We will talk about our brains what science can tell us about our emotions and how our bodies and mind work as one. Our chapters will focus on mental health at work and will also provide you with useful tools for your everyday life. Now more than ever, it is time to destigmatize mental health conversations so we can all feel safe to be open and find support. Throughout the series, we will have the honor of welcoming five renowned guests from our industry who have generously accepted to come and start this conversation with us. Caitlin Young, visual effects supervisor at Alpha Studios and on Forbes 30 under 30 list to watch in Hollywood. Chris White, visual effects supervisor at Weather Digital, who has worked on movies such as Planet of the Apes, King Kong, The Hobbit, and is currently busy on the next Avatar. John Dykstra, visual effects supervisor, recipient of three Academy Awards and co-founder of Industrial Light and Magic. Monica Lago Caters, producer and CEO at Frogbot Films. She served as associate producer at Walt Disney Animation on Record Ralph and Zootopia, then made her live action debut on Netflix, The Christmas Chronicles. Mark Osborne, director of Kung Fu Panda and Le Petit Prince, film producer, screenwriter, and animator. What an amazing lineup. But before further introducing today's guest, I would like to welcome our three mental health professionals who will accompany us throughout this journey. Dr. Melanie Bilbo, who is a psychiatrist at Centre Hospitalier de l'Université de Montréal, in short, CHUM. She's completed her Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience, Medical Degree and Psychiatry Residence at McGill University and her Fellowship in Consultational Liaison Psychiatry at Mont Sinai Hospital in New York. She specializes in mind-body interactions with a particular interest in building resilience and mental well-being. She's also a passionate violinist and certified yoga instructor. Dr. Drea Lettermendi, who is a licensed clinical psychologist, professor, and media consultant. She received her undergraduate degree from Cornell University and her PhD in psychology from UCSD. Dr. Lettermendi currently serves as the acting director of the UCLA Student Resilience Center, where she works with college students in the areas of empathy and resilience building crisis response, and suicide prevention. Dr. Lettermendi is a TEDx UCLA speaker and recently delivered a session on resilience and media during a pandemic as part of the special COVID-19 series called Conversations with TED. Her work on the intersections of pop culture and psychological science have been featured in The Atlantic, The Guardian, Vanity Fair, and The Los Angeles Times. And last but not least, Camille Charbonneau, who is a mental performance consultant with a master's degree in performance and sport psychology. For the last six years, she has been helping high performance see the value that mental skills training has on performance and everyday life. Through teaching tools and strategies based on sport psychology research, she helps people feel confident and focused when it matters the most. Camille has worked with musicians, athletes, coaches, children, and business leaders. Her experience as an athlete, educator, and personal trainer make her a consultant with a wide variety of skills. With a holistic approach, she helps people build lifelong skills that ultimately help cultivate more balance, focus, and happiness. Melanie, Drea, and Camille, thank you so much for taking part in this initiative and sharing your knowledge with our audience. We're incredibly grateful to have you here with us today. One last thing before we get started. As part of the Release Your Creativity project, we would like to thank our supporters without whom the series would not have been possible. The City of Montreal, as well as the studios supporting the project, Caribara Montreal, DNEC, Framestore, Method Studios, Real Effects, and Technicolor. Thank you. This series is available on the visualeffectsociety.com website, vfxmontreal.com, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. But now... Let's get into it. Today we're going to talk about normalizing stress, anxiety, and the pressure to perform with our special guest, Caitlin Young. 
With more than a decade of visual effects industry experience, Caitlin founded Alpha Studios in 2013 to provide her clients with high-quality visual effects services. With a team that is on a mission to push the limits of technology and maximize visual creativity, no matter the challenge. Caitlin has amassed more than 50 visual effects credits to her name, including Robot Chicken, Grace Anatomy, The Good Doctor, and Part of Five. Caitlin is often invited to speak at conferences and with members of the media regarding visual effects trends and themes, such as diversity and inclusion, women in business, entrepreneurism, and leadership. Her insights have been published in Bloomberg, Variety, Los Angeles Times, The Effects Voice, and many more. Caitlin holds a bachelor degree in animation and digital arts from USC Film School and an MBA from Quantic School of Business and Technology. She is currently obtaining an organizational psychology certificate program at Harvard. Caitlin is a Forbes 30 under 30 list maker for Hollywood, member and former co-chair of the Visual Effects Society, and a member of the Academy of Television Arts and Science. Caitlin also just co-founded One in Four, a non-profit which is an intersectional coalition of disabled creatives currently working in Hollywood, focused on long-term institutional shifts to increase employment and authentic representation of disabled people. As a Chinese-American immigrant woman and a wheelchair user, she believes that more overlooked talents can be found at the intersections of disability and all other diverse populations. Caitlin, welcome and thank you for being with us today. Truly appreciate it. But now let's talk about stress, anxiety in the industry. What does it look like for different people involved, different types of symptoms, and how it can affect our performance and wellness? I think for me, you know, uh, a question that, that I think I... I think we can start off with is um, who here has no anxiety or stress at all, right? I think that just goes to show how much um, we're all affected by our normal, um, you know, kind of what's been asked of us for work in terms of anxiety and stress and how little, if at all, we talk about it and think this is so important. And I think as um, a lot of our stress and traumas build up in the subconscious. It, it comes out in different ways, whether it be anger or high anxiety or burnouts. You know, I think um, this is a great time to talk about this in where hopefully towards the tail end of the pandemic, uh, let's hope and um, yeah, and give us tools to better prepare for what's to come. I think we can look at this in kind of two ways, like how we can recognize our own stress, right? And then how we can cope with it. Um, because as as you made clear, everyone goes through stress and anxiety. Um, but I think it's if we can reframe those situations and think about how we can better manage stress, then we can tackle those situations with a better mindset, right? Um, and it all starts with the recognition. Um, how do we feel when we're stressed? What makes us stressed or anxious? And a lot of people don't know the answers to that, right? So how can we even begin to to have that conversation and begin that reflection, right? Um, for a lot of the athletes that I work with, it's it's just journaling. It's, you know, every day, what came up today? What stressed me? How did I feel? And it's not necessarily taking action right away, but just reflecting on those, on, on those emotions. Caitlin, can you talk about what it looked like for you when you first discovered that you were feeling stressed as it related to your work? Yeah. Um, so, you know, so I started out in the industry as a freelance um, compositor. I started out, you know, in the junior compositing role. I did have to um, work my way through college as well. So taking a full course load at a school like USC Film School and working 40 plus hours a week in visual effects. Right. That was a stress on its own. And, you know, that really kind of came from a financial need, right, for me, how to still pay the bills and, you know, all my monthly, you know, um, kind of costs and so forth. And what I noticed, you know, when I was, you know, kind of working and going to school was that I, there, you know, there was so much that, that was on my docket every day. I was going to school during the night and then working the night shift, you know, so I did that for many years. Um, I didn't have any room in my schedule to just think. 
<laughs> it was always constantly go, 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 right? And I think a lot of people in major cities like LA can relate, right? I ate so many meals in my car sitting in traffic because that was the only time I had. And, you know, looking back, I think because, you know, I started out in the industry that way, I didn't really um, give myself any time to figure out what better foundations can I lay down, right? For me to have time to myself, for me to really ask myself, can I take on this one other obligation? Is it worth it? You know, is there anything else on my docket that I can delay, you know, or, or revisit and, at another time? And over time, you know, stress manifested in ways like checking my email, right? Knowing that I will get, you know, nasty feedbacks, you know, possibly nasty feedbacks from supervisors, from clients and so forth. And, you know, just every day turning on the computer and logging in, that created a high intense level of stress. And that, you know, also triggered to needing more caffeine, you know, to kind of, you know, mentally stay awake. But, you know, after so much caffeine, your thoughts get kind of numb, right? They kind of become white noise in the background and you're just kind of going on autopilot, trying to get everything done, um, you know? And I was noticing that I, you know, like new interactions um, really took a toll on me, right? Like once you're working, you know, 10, 12 hours a day and if a friend invites you to try out this new bar on this other side of town, then all of a sudden that, you know, added to the, you know, kind of the, the length of your day and, you know, um, in, and being in, in um, environments where you just kind of had to pretend, you know, to shoot the breeze and not really talk about what's, you know, really on, on my mind at the time. Um, and then, you know, it also manifested into anxiety attacks in my car, right? And just wanting to sit in that parking lot forever before going in, you know, or before driving home. And that was when I realized that, hey, I don't have the best of tools for this, right? I feel like I had the best knowledge, right? Um, shout out Trojans. I felt like I had the best um, education when it came to filmmaking and visual effects and all that good jazz, but I didn't have anything even close to approaching my mental health. I didn't even know it was mental health at the time, right? I just thought, this is normal, right? Everyone, everyone is stressed. This is great. Everyone is tired all the time. Yeah, you know, this is, this is part of you know, your late 20s, early 30s, whatever it may be, um, not realizing that it doesn't, this doesn't have to go on forever. And I wasn't putting in the same dedication into improving my mental health as I did improving my compositing skills and lighting skills and composition skills and map painting skills, right? All the other things that I have no problems just, you know, watching a five hour tutorial and learn a new skill, but I didn't know how to do that when it comes to um, improving my mental health. Well, even as a Bruin, I can't disagree with you. For anyone out there who, who uh, is embedded in the Los Angeles rivalry. Uh, it, I, I do want to uplift something that you did mention, um, which is sort of the what is this question. It's such an important part. It's what Cam um, identified as one of the very first steps of this process. Is this stress? Is this anxiety? Is it burnout? And what you just described is exactly what we recommend people do. Um, have that check-in. Where am I feeling the stress and how is it manifesting? I love that you said that, like this is how it was manifesting for me. It's a full body experience. For some people it's heart palpitations and sweating and um, you know parts of their body just feel like not like themselves. For others, it's very thought-based, cognitive, um, ruminations, worry. You mentioned a fixation on kind of checking your work and checking email. And then for others, it's it could be very emotional. This might be the experience of um, dips in mood, sadness, feeling isolated, feeling desperate, hopeless. Those are all um, possible um, uh, combinations of how stress looks like. And we all experience stress differently. And so this is a good place to start. What is this? What is this looking like for me? And then how is that going to pivot me into some? Yeah, um, you know, I really credit this um, to um, the VFX artist at Corridor Digital. They're highly popular on YouTube. I suggest you checking them out. But uh, many years ago, we decided that um, once a week we will form an acting and directing group. Um, it's very peer to peer and just try to you know, kind of um, add new skills to our 
our repertoire of how do you, you know, evoke an emotion out of an actor? How can you craft this scene so these are the you know, emotional points that we're hitting? And I remember we always had a opening exercise just to describe how you feel head to toe. And um, when we first started, that was something that was, uh, you know, also gave me anxiety and stress because I didn't know how to answer that question, right? Because I never really took the time to feel, oh, how does my shoulder feel today? I have no idea, right? How, how does my mind feel today? How does my heart feel? I have no idea. And um, it, it, it was, you know, at first it was really stressful approaching something so new. And I think it just takes you into another headspace, right? Especially if you, you know, like many visual effects practitioners do, we just sit in front of a computer all day and, you know, kind of very, you know, um, gets entrenched in our own thoughts and, you know, seeing what kind of visuals that we can make out or uh, enhance or delete, you know, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden for us, we really have to use another part of our brain to describe, right, in detail, something that's very invisible and something that's very vulnerable too. And so that really kind of became, you know, my metrics and like, hey, how am I doing today, right? Am I just saying good, fine, or any other words that really doesn't carry anything behind them? Or can I give an answer that, you know, can let other people in my world know like, hey, I'm feeling kind of low today, right? This is where I can really use, um, you know, some support and I would love it if you can show up for me, you know, this way, you know, in this meeting coming up or whatever it may be. But that, you know, took many years over, you know, almost a decade of practice for me to feel at least comfortable, you know, talking. I appreciate it as well that you talked about sort of when you were much younger and working full time and studying full time at the same time. And the idea behind me, I think we can all do this, especially when when we're younger, for short periods of time, we can use stress in that way. It can actually be very, very helpful. You know, the stress can actually propel us. You have the cortisol running through your body. It's sort of you know, almost like you're reacting to a bear. You're trying to run away from it. You can do the all-nighters and then night and day. It's it's more when we start looking long-term that this becomes more of an issue for the body and for the mind. So when you're having these elevated levels of hormones and this chronic high stress that doesn't, it's sort of a pressure valve that never gets released. And it really can in terms of the body, as Dr. Drea was mentioning too, that some of the body effects people can have, you could actually also end up with higher risk of asthma, you can have higher risk of cardiovascular problems, you also become more susceptible to illness. So people notice that their immune system actually gets more affected over time, they'll get colds more easily. Um, and the brain effects too, that people are then more susceptible to anxiety, to depression, to burnout. People may be more likely to use drugs and alcohol to cope with it as well. So I think it's there's many different ways that people can cope, but there really are effects on the body that that changes you over time too when you're maintaining it. I also think it's it's interesting that there there is a sort of there's a perfect balance of stress. There's this concept called you stress that having too much stress is is no good and leads to all the effects that I, I just mentioned. But having zero stress as well is is not great either. You know that we we like to have a little bit. You know that is obviously you're in this work because you're passionate about it. It's exciting. It's something that drives you. So that little bit of stress is is actually helpful, but not not to the point where. You know, and, and I'm sure also finding out, figuring out how to deal with the higher levels of stress, bringing you back to an area where you actually could enjoy your work again. Yeah, um, I think something that people don't mention, you know, especially for visual effects, um, you know, it's the hardware, it's the software, it's all that. But so much of it also has to do with stamina, right? Um, as a junior artist, right, oh, I did so many overnights, whereas now I, I can't do that, right? Um, <laughs> um, and I think, you know, when you know that you're walking into a stressful work schedule like that and then without having any tools in your arsenal to manage stress in a, you know in a healthy way you know in my you know early 20s i turned to alcohol right that was kind of my one coping mechanism that i thought would keep the stress at bay and would just you know take the edge off and from to just buy a few hours of time for me to get the next thing done the few hours became days months and years you know and in and you know um, looking back in hindsight, right now that you know I'm, um, you know, I, I go to weekly therapy is where I, you know, have a safe space to let out all of my, you know, anger and frustrations and work through my own anxieties and my own trauma and you know really dissect my coping mechanisms and see if that you know that is the best way or if, you know I still need to deep, um, you know, dig deeper. But I wish that we can normalize this as part of the industry because they are hand in hand in order for you to work these long hours you need to be mentally healthy first and foremost it is 
I will argue, more vital than being physical. Just to speak to um, what Dr. Melanie said and Caitlin, what you said about, um, you know, tuning in with your emotions and your body and, and the nervous system, I believe that meditation is such a powerful tool to be more connected with our thoughts and our emotions and, and our body, not only to, you know, help us, um, it does so many things. I mean, meditation changed my, my life and it continues to change the lives of the, of the people I work with, but it can help you not only find a state of calmness or relaxation and kind of balance out the nervous system, but it's literally a way to train your brain to uh, be aware of your thoughts and distractions and, and come back to the, the present moment and refocus faster. And I think, I mean, meditation practice should, everyone should be doing it. It's a great way to, it's a, it's a two for one, a great way to, to release any tension, to reset um, our mental headspace and to, to recenter and, and come back into tune with how we feel and, and take action on after that, because it's, I think a lot of people struggle with, with having that reflection. And Caitlin, it seems like you, you're, you're very skilled in, in your self-awareness. And like you said, that took time, right? It's, it's not a, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. And I loved, right. I'd love to know if you practice meditation or any um, breathing I'm glad strategies. We bring it up because um, I have to be honest here, right? Just say even 10 years ago, I thought all of this was frou-frou and weird and probably wouldn't help me. Um, sorry if you see my dogs in the background, they're kind of just, you know, claiming their domain. Um, yeah, I didn't believe in therapy. I didn't believe in journaling, meditation, setting aside rituals, uh, kind of, you know, patterns, traditions. I just thought it sounds nice, but my schedule is really busy and I, I don't have time to do that, right? 10 years ago, that would have been my go-to response. And then um, one of my friends said, you really just have to do, go through the motions, just do it. And then after you do it for a week, then evaluate and say, is this a waste of my time? Is this not a good fit for me? And, you know, the first thing I did was journaling, right? Because I always carry a journal. I think this comes from my art school days. And I didn't even know to journal. So I just drew on my pages again, like the same thing I did, you know, during college and taking notes and just more drawing than, you know, the actual um, co you know, content of the class itself. But, you know, I, I began to see the value of setting a pattern and having consistency in your day when a lot of, you know, our work, it's really inconsistent. Right. I think that's, you know, the pattern of visual effects, whether it be, you know, um, the quality of your work or like deadlines and pushes and delays. But knowing that, hey, for 30 minutes here and an hour here, these are my time. You know, I think that does something subconsciously to really ground you to know that this is a safe space, no matter how else in like however, you know, many other things in your life that is uncontrollable. These are the angers, you know, and these are really helping. So. Um, journaling is a really great way for that. Um, I personally love bullet journals. I think, again, it helps with, you know, the creativity and drawing aspects of it as well. Um, I also, I'm a very competitive person. Uh, so I, I love using um, meditation apps like Headspace and Calm. Um, they kind of give, you know, keeps, you know, track of how many hours, you know, you've done and how many days in a row you've completed something. And I think, you know, it just kind of makes a really fun game out of it. And I really appreciate that there are different time commitments to meditation as well, right? I'll do something as little as a minute or as, you know, as many, you know, as long as 30 minutes, if I have the time, five minutes, 10 minutes, I think, you know, a lot of these apps now, they're giving you the option of like, hey, what is your time commitment right now? You don't have to give us four hours of your time, right? You can kind of slowly dip your toe in and try something for five minutes and see if this, you know, kind of visualization and, you know, really being still is of something of beneficial to you, you know, you know, so I think that's, you know, these are all great things um, that I really encourage everyone. If you're like me, who don't believe in any of this, cool. Give it a try, right? Give it a try and see if it brings out, you know, anything um, worth keep exploring. You know? I like that you mentioned that meditation doesn't have to be like 30 minutes or an hour. And, and the research is on, you know, 30 minutes for eight weeks. And um, that's a program that I took and it changed my life. But there's also research on five minutes. And, and then I work with people who meditate just, you know, three times a week for five minutes. And, and that changes their their mindset as well so just starting small and building from there and like you mentioned there's there's different applications and what's important is to find something you like right there's so many different types of like guided meditations out there um so just figuring out whether you know you like the body scan or 
um, a focus meditation or an imagery meditation and, and having fun with it at the end of the day is, is what's important. Yeah. When stress is contextualized in our work or professional environment, it's called burnout. Burnout is characterized by emotional exhaustion, hopelessness, and difficulties dealing with even everyday tasks and doing your job effectively. But there's also this reduced feeling of personal accomplishment. So there's this impact there um, based on social values, based on the culture of the industry, the beliefs we hold. Caitlin, I'm wondering if you can talk freely about the burnout that you experienced and, and what you think might have contributed to that. Yeah, um, I think my first, um, I guess, episode of burnout happened during school. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm a big believer that I do have all the tools within me to work through any problems. And this came about in my junior year of working on my dissertation. And I became so burned out that I just couldn't look at another computer monitor. <laughs> I just couldn't do it, which was a problem, you know, having one more year left. And luckily um, for, for, you know, financial reasons as well, I found out that um, studying abroad would um, also be more affordable for that particular semester. So I was like, yes, let me sign me up, right? Let me do it. And I think that really changed my mind. Um, it, it really changed my life and kind of my, my outlook on life too. Um, I was lucky enough to study in Florence, Italy. And I remember, you know, being the type A person when I, you know, got off the plane, I was asking for Wi-Fi passwords so I can log on my, you know, email and see what I missed during the flight. And everyone's like, yeah, we don't have Wi-Fi here. <laughs> I was like, what? what am, right? So I was essentially forced, right, for six months to do exactly what I told myself I couldn't do. I, I wasn't on the computer often, right? I had a camera in my hand. I documented um, this amazing, beautiful, historic city. And, you know, I traveled around in, you know, in dirt cheap ways, but I was able to really get out of my head and, you know, kind of get away from my issues, I you know, I guess, but in a way that made sense for me to run away from a little bit, knowing that, you know, eventually I'll come back, but hopefully on my journey, you know, I'll have more tools, you know, to kind of equip me to, you know, to finish out my, uh, my time at USC. And what I really saw, you know, through the Italian ways of living is just how much, how much detail is paid to every aspect of connection, right? Whether a conversation, right? It's never timed. And I think, you know, living in, you know, a busy city like LA, a lot of times you will put someone on your calendar just for this amount of time, right? And in, in, in many cities in Europe, that's not like that. You're just there to share your experience, make a connection, and hopefully there to listen and support each other and walk away with that feeling that, oh, I made a connection with someone. And I think that really helped me to see how much of that like I didn't have it all right in my in my life, you know, back back at school. And that was when I really started to um, looking at all my time commitments and really evaluate. Is this something that's wise for me to take on or am I stretching myself thin? You know, um, and, you know, this came from a really recent discovery as well as recent as last week. Right. I think a lot of times I would take something on for the fear of um scarcity right um having grew up with so little and you know with my time freelancing you never knew when your next job was going to come about you kind of have this subconscious tendency to take on everything that's thrown your way because right just you know keep the train you know moving that way and that was a ha moment for me too you know to, to kind of just give myself permission to say no more you know and value my own time um because I, I i do a lot of great thinking when i just have a chunk of free time not like 30 minutes here and 15 minutes here right i just i just want more breathing room you know and that again it came from decade long you know kind of self-improvement on figuring out exactly why my schedule was always full I think what you're talking about too is actually very there there has been studies that have shown that that's actually protective against burnout as well so being able to set some time aside like you're saying to have the time to, to either check in with yourself or you mentioned the weekly meeting too as part of your team or the the weekly therapy appointment so this time for for yourself in many different ways as a form of self-care and also i think in terms of learning to say no to certain projects too i think sometimes it's it's very difficult when you're in an industry where there's so such high expectations and such a high workload too but to figure out what what are you comfortable with what are the boundaries that 
that you do want to put up as well too, as opposed to saying yes to everything all the time. Or if you are, then figuring out where does this come from and does it come from a place where I really do want to say yes because this will further my career and trying to change my mindset around it? Or is it something that I probably should say no to because it could lead to burnout if I keep saying yes to, to everything? Yeah, I'm noticing too that the more I... Um... I really reserve time, you know, to do things that are important to me. Um, I think I'm becoming a better leader. Hopefully I am, right? I think when I started in 2013, I was probably a leader that I probably don't want to work with. And I'm just really grateful, you know, for kind of the patience and the understanding for my team, you know, to stick it out with me through this long. But, um, you know, because, you know, when I hung when I hung up my, my freelancing hat, it wasn't because I didn't like the work, right? I always loved the work. And to this day, it's, you know, it's my biggest passion in my life, you know, to continue to put out good, you know, visual effects work. But it was really, um, you know, the people and the bureaucracy and the stress and the anxiety. And it, you know, it kind of warped itself into this perfect storm. I remember one day I was, you know, working a late night shift. I think I got off and maybe like 3 a.m. And I was completely on, on autopilot at the time. And I was, you know, I was driving home in LA and I'm mistaking a green light to go forward for a green to turn left, right? Luckily, there's only one other car on the road and they honked at me and I was like, oh, right. But that was really a wake up call that I've been working too much. And I, you know, and this could easily have been a really bad T-bone accident if I, you know, if there were more cars on the road, right? If any other circumstance just changed by a little bit, you know, and I think that, you know, came from like leadership, right? Is it okay to have people on your team work 14 hour days for months on end, right? You're employing people. It's, it, you know, you're not employing computers. Um, so I used to also um, work at the Apple store, right? And I'll, you know, I worked there at night. So I will always remember this image, or, you know, you know, do my little key code and go into the store when everything is closed, that visual effects companies are people. They're not computers. They're not selling inventory at the Apple store at night, right? You need, you know, visual effects companies are very much to do with everywhere and more attention needs to be put on those personnel than your hardware. And sometimes those, those, those people might feel uh, in, in, in a position where they can't say no. What are they going to do about that? It's, it's, it's something a, a very used to problem within our industry is we're moving around the world and um, you don't have any social network in your in the city you're at you are on a work permit and if you and you you, you basically have this feeling of if I'm saying no to the task or to this note or to staying late or to whatsoever I'm being asked to do uh, that it might risk your job and with your job your uh, your position within the country your 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 home your your private surroundings um, how to deal with this kind of stress. Yeah, I think, you know, it is very um, personal, but, you know, one, you know, kind of way of thinking about it is, are you okay being distressed for another 10 years, right? Am I okay driving home at 3 a.m. every night? I'm not. That's not what I sign up for, right? And I think another key, you know, component is that, a lot of people that I personally know myself included in the visual effects industry is that we have so little time for family and friends, and yet they're really going to be our anchors when we're just floating or we're on autopilot when everything's going numb, you know, or coming home at like 3 a.m. at night. Um, you know, we really have to make time and keep those people updated and know that it needs to be a two way street, right? Make time for them, you know, um, to kind of share our own. Um, vulnerabilities and insecurities and have a regular dialogue. I think that's, it's really key is, you, you, you know, you do have to not only, right, building up your career and keep that going at the same time, but you, re but you really need to keep an eye on your support system because you never know when you're going to need that. For many industries as well, they're noticing that they're, for the very high stress, chronic stress industries, they're sort of noticing that presenteeism is becoming an issue. So absenteeism being, let's say people take a day off because they're unwell. Presenteeism is when people are, let's say, experiencing burnout and they're showing up, but they're not mentally performing at the level that they should be doing. And overall, so according to the Mental Health Commission of Canada, there it causes eight times greater productivity losses than absenteeism. So I think within some ind industries, noticing that really making sure that your employees are actually doing well, functioning at a good level makes them more productive and otherwise can also lead to to higher turnover, to higher losses as well in the job. So it's 
obviously depends on on the industry and how everything is structured. But I I do think that there's there's a real benefit, actually, an economic benefit to many companies to actually keeping the employees working at a level that they can maintain for long periods of time. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you call me up at seven a.m., I am no good to anyone. <laughs> I'm gonna spend three hours just getting my coffee right before I can actually do anything productive, <laughs> you know. But then if you shift my day, then all of a sudden it's great, right? And just giving that flexibility, and you know, so much of what we talked about is just invisible, right? We all feel it, but it's never been brought up, um, you know. And for、uh, for people who don't know, I'm a wheelchair user, and so I recently had a friend ask me, how can we these the these the Destigmatize disabilities, physical disabilities, and make them as common as say wearing glasses, right? Because I I see my wheelchair just as that, right? You know, right now I'm wearing contacts, but without them, I'm again no good to anyone really.、Um, but and and the only way to turn something,、um, you know, from you know kind of having high You know,、um, discrimination as using a wheelchair to using glasses is we have to normalize it, and the only way to do that is through words and language and bring them up as often as we do that, and then over time, you know, no one will really you know think about it if you're wearing glasses or showing up with a scooter or showing up with a wheelchair or having you know a knee brace or whatever. And so much of mental health is that too, right? If we talk about oh yeah, you know, I'm setting aside time this weekend to go to therapy and really process that. It really wouldn't be a big deal, but you know, it's it's when only one or two people speak up very sparingly here or there. That's what's keep adding to like, oh, maybe this isn't for me, right? Like maybe maybe I shouldn't spend my time getting a bullet journal.、It、wouldn't lead to anything, right? It just you you have to say them out loud to give others permission to just try it. For you.、Uh- Kaylin, what was the turning point where you decided? You mentioned that your friend was saying, "Okay, now you should go to therapy." What was the point for yourself when you said, "You know what? I, I've got to try something different." That obviously there was a certain period of time where where you were sort of just going with the flow and falling into it. For you, was there a sort of wake up moment? And yeah,、um, I think my wake up moment came two folds.、Um, one. Um, this is now, you know, a little comedic bit, but for the longest time, I had no idea that people went to Costco for things other than booze. It's like, oh, that's oh, they have roasted chicken. Oh, this is good, right? Because I was so dependent on alcohol to just really keep, you know, keep everything moving and not having a freakout moment because I, again, didn't even have time in my schedule, and that. Little, you know, very bad coping mechanism really came to a halt when I began having、um, anxiety attacks in my car. I was like, well, I can't drink, right? Obviously, and so then I was like, well, I don't have any other coping mechanisms, and the one that I have, you know, that serves its purpose for so long, it's no longer working. And that was my wake up call to、um, right get into therapy and learn you know other ways right even of just refining the language that I use when I'm talking to myself you know and how I can process my own emotions and ways of you know I think、um, what really hooked me onto therapy was you know I had this tendency of always playing back some little tidbit that I said. Right in a long interview, but I will only focus on that one little tidbit that I'm sure no one else would, you know, was even paying attention. But I will play that over and over and over in my head, and I just knew that that wasn't normal. But I didn't know that there was an off switch. Yeah, the off switch is talking about it, and then take the lesson from it, and then put that in your shelf of life lessons, and then move on. Right, the only way to turn that off is to work through that. And you know, it took me about thirty years before I made that realization. I think that's that's a question that I I get sometimes too in terms. Of, so when when should I come see a psychiatrist or when should I come see a psychologist or how do I know? And I think you've touched a bit on that too. I think it's when you've noticed to some extent that your your life or your level of function is being affected. But I think there's a certain level that we all feel stress at work, that we can all feel family stress or you know very specific stress with public speaking. That I think stress is a very familiar feeling to, to all of us in different settings. But when it starts to bleed into the point where you're not feeling like yourself anymore, like you're having either if you're having panic attacks, but even let's say it's affecting your work, it's affecting even when you're usually seeing your friends and family, you're able to be happy, you're not able to be that way anymore. I think that that's that's a good point of saying, okay, you know, now at least I should go and ask for help to see whether it's a psychologist or psychiatrist. I think depends on on how you're doing and also what tools that you would like to reach out for as well too. And、um, for a psychiatrist, I can prescribe I can prescribe medications. Uh, I use some therapies, but therapies tend to be more specific, also to psychologists, to also different workers who have training in in therapy as well. 
Um, so I think honestly, just the first step of reaching out to say, okay, this is, I need some help, even to your primary care provider, and then figuring out what is the best, what is the best treatment. I also think maybe it's just a term we're using, right? Therapy, because I know a lot of my male colleagues, they're just so, um, you know, kind of, I guess, scared by even bringing up therapy. What if we call it mental gym? What if we call it like mental leveling up, right? Whatever it may be, because you're really just taking your thoughts and and right, kind of like the um, the um, the Asian proverb, right? Like um, take the fish with spit out the bones. Like what's good, what's bad? Um, the longer you don't get into this way of processing, that's when things build up, and that's when right you get into these patterns of thoughts you can't turn off, of thinking the same thing over and over again, right? And not having the words to, to even describe what that means. So I, you know, encourage people, go to therapy when you feel good. Talk about what makes you feel good. Cause whenever you feel bad, you need to do more of what, you know, makes you feel good to really dig yourself out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think if we highlight that concept of going when we feel good, then it would get rid of that taboo. And, you know, seeing a psychologist or psychiatrist or mental skills consultant is only when you're weak. Um, I work with a lot of athletes and, you know, they're shy to come to me and then they're shy that, you know, maybe their coach are going to find out, will find out. But at the end of the day, we're, we're getting a, you a mental edge, right? You're, you're creating these, these, you're discovering these tools and strategies to, to perform better mentally, to, to be more consistent and, um, filling your toolbox with all these things that you can use, not just in sport or performance, but outside as well and making those connections. Uh, is really powerful to just to know that these mental skills that you learn, um, even for you, Caitlin, I'm sure the ones you're learning is not just important for your career, but like in anything, in relationships and in, in your personal life. Um, so I like, I really love that idea of a, of a mental gym. And um, I have a question for perhaps Dr. Melanie or Dr. Drea, for those who can't access, um, you know, a psychiatrist or psychologist, what would be the, what would be a better first step? How can we how can we be start to be curious about our our own mental health, or how can we develop some tools or strategies without seeing someone physically? Yeah, it's it's not uncommon for individuals to be either hesitant to reach out formally to to receive formal um, assistance. And also you named something which is really important, access to mental health providers that not everybody has the same equitable access to the care that they uh, may benefit from. And I think a lot of the solutions, and you know, there are a number of solutions. One is that more, um, more globally, we as a mental health system need to improve many of our structures so that the information like the, like the kinds of things we're sharing today are available to people who um, have the right to know how they can benefit um, from these skills. And then second, uh, your question about individuals seeking support. There are a lot of ways that these methods and strategies are available through community building, through um, church organizations, even through professional relationships, which is a newer um newer strategy. So companies and organizations are building internal uh, support systems and internal uh, um, uh, programs, practices for professionals to follow and, and to support one another through. So I think there are some things up ahead that, that can be particularly helpful for an individual who does not have uh, community support like that. I definitely recommend um, looking toward uh, uh, applications, uh, um, apps, and and other um, uh, mindful resilience building programs as a start, so they can start to improve their um, repertoire around the kinds of skills that. I also want to give you know one more resource. Um, so I I, I I watch so many videos a day just for work, um, but the one great resource I found is um, a website. There's also an, an accompanying YouTube channel as well. It's just called Personal Development School. And they have recorded sessions that are very affordable. You can do one-offs or you can you know, have a monthly membership or all access membership. And they have so many videos on so many different topics. And for example, how to set boundaries, right? How to say no, right? Like how to um, manage anxiety when you're having an anxiety attack. And those videos are very bite-sized even that even watch, I think, you know, um, 
right? Like I'm, I'm subscribed, so I get their kind of daily videos that's always between five or 10 minutes. And, you know, I really like these bite-sized nuggets that I can, you know, just put on the back burner and, and continue, you know, um, continue to think about it. So, yeah, there are other ways, um, you know, and I, when I first started therapy, you know, I was very, I, I was very vulnerable in a way that I let my therapist know, like, hey, so I'm going to probably be canceling a lot um, to say that I'm busy. Please hold me accountable. And if I do, please offer a rescheduled date and don't let me off the hook. I think this is, you know, um, if, you know, if you know that about yourself, right, put that up front, right? Put in um, kind of barriers in place for you to keep something long enough before you make a judgment, you know, whether this is good or bad for you, right? Like for me, right, my um, my therapist is in is within a walking um, distance from my house right i can't say oh i don't have time to go it's right there it's on the way home it's on the way to work it's on the way from work right i'm just you know creating any and all ways to limit distractions and you know i think that really has helped me you know kind of uh, keep going consistently for the past um, three plus years okay. um just to build on on a bit of what uh, what all of you just said so there there are some things that you can can do to just stay mentally healthy yourself too. So doing exercise on a regular basis, so at least three times a week, is something that I think we we may not all have time to do through, but doing that consistently has actually been shown to improve mood, to decrease anxiety overall. Um, and so that, and for that, there's a relatively low barrier of entry. So I mean, just as long as you, you don't hurt yourself, it could be going for a walk outside. So it's, that, that's something that I recommend to everyone. Trying to get good sleep is another, another major thing as well. So trying to sleep at the same time, waking up at the same time, so trying to build in, which is, is obviously depends on the job too in the industry, how, how easily you can get to bed at the same time too, but it's something that to at least be mindful of that's something that that would actually be helpful. And things like like meditation, the different apps that you mentioned as well too, can also be helpful. Um, but also, Caitlin, what I thought was interesting is that sometimes I, I do see what, what you're mentioning as well too, that in terms of for some people, so for many people, the access is an issue that they either don't have the financial the financial means to get it or really just the wait list is months and months and months away. So they, they can't actually get into season, which I think is really an issue that, that has to be addressed more at the systemic level, that mental health should be spoken about more and really the need should be, should be met for really all across the world. Um, but sometimes I do see people who might have the means and might have the time to set aside for it, but they, they may either not be ready or they may have their own stigma against it as well too. So they, they could be something that they're making certain excuses for themselves saying, you know what, I, I don't really have the time right now. But let's say they may make time for many other things that are higher up in the priority list. So I think what you did in terms of making it as easy as you can for yourself, you know, picking someone where you're less likely to, to quit because it's, it's right in front of you and really telling your therapist up front, this is, you know, this is who I, I may cancel, really just hold me accountable to, I think is one of the best things that that you can do in therapy as well. So to, to be as honest as you can and say, look, this is this is what I would like to get out of this. I don't want to cancel, but this is sort of maybe my pattern or what may, or just, you know, I'm a very busy job. So it's, it may not even be intentional, but please, I, I really do want to be here. Um, and that that really can change also, I think, your relationship with your therapist and also makes it more likely to actually to get what you want yeah. out of the therapy um, as well. I think just having some sort of consistency, I think that's the key to managing burnouts, you know, and managing your own anxiety. You know, I know for me, you know, um, many years ago, right, um, therapy was a cost that was really hard um, to financially sustain. And I was having a chat with a friend about it and she was like, uh huh. So how much does that drink on your hand? It's like, okay, good point, good point, right? I think there are many ways that we can um, save here and there without drastically altering our kind of lifestyles to kind of make this affordable. Um, I think another thing that, you know, because I get a lot, I get so many questions about like my age, which is weird because it's something I never really thought about. But I know for me, um, switching to a plant-based diet, it like, it shed like 10 years off my life. I felt instantly younger, right? And that's a conscious decision, knowing if I'm on set, if I'm, you know, sitting in one place, if I get the urge to snack, right? Is there a better option that I can reach for? Always just think about that. Like, what am I doing? Can I one up this somehow, right? Instead of grabbing chips, can I grab some carrots, right? Can I do something a little, because a little bit, it adds up, right? All, all this that I'm doing, like now it's become, you know, a natural part of me. But even five years ago, right? Going to therapy on a Saturday was like, oh, really don't want to get out of the house, right? Whatever it may be. But now, because the more that you do it and the more that, that you know, um, you see the value that it's bringing you, I think that's what's going to, you know, keep you, keep you going. 
Um, can we talk a little bit about the little demon in the back of the head telling us, um, oh yeah, uh, I didn't get this shot assigned because um, I'm not good enough to do the work or the other person got the shot because this person is so much better or, uh, oh, I'm only receiving negative feedback because uh, I'm not good enough. Um, oh, I'm going to lose my job over this. These these day-to-day -day artist um, thoughts and and how to deal with those and 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 what your experiences was those caitlin yeah um i think um so you know i i'm a big fan of brene brown and her work and all the books that she has made that I, i think really offers a easy step into you know mental health and how to be vulnerable and i think you know is it, it it was her who said you know to give you insecurity a name call it something bob peter and whatever it is, right? Because it's, I now see it as kind of like a sign that you're in, you know, that, that you're on the right path. Because I know for me, I never want to be in a position of saying, yep, this is the best that I can make. We are at the pinnacle, we are done, right? I never want to be in that position. Therefore, there are always going to be doubts and ways to improve and, oh, it's, you know, am I better than this person and that person, you know, and, For, for right for me for for many years i really wanted to improve my drafting skills as you know an artist with charcoal and pencil and you know that is just not my strength <laughs> it is not you look at my work you look at everyone else's work like yeah it's not up to par right but i enjoy the process and i think that's important we, we always focus on the end results but like what did you learn in the process right so for my figure drawing days i learned so much about line weights That to this day, I'm just like, oh, this line, it could have been weighted differently, you know, and it will look so much more, right? There, there's things that, that we can take away from, I think, all of our journeys. If we look at it, it's like, hey, what, what am I supposed to learn from this? What does this keep teaching me? Why do I keep finding myself at the same place every time? What is it that happened last time that I didn't even get to absorb or, you know, kind of really deconstruct and then yet again it's in my face again right i think that's um kind of my my new lens of looking at insecurities and doubts of like hey is this actually true right am i such a horrible artist that no one will ever book me ever again my reels are going to be terrible right they're going to be bad comments on all of our projects this movie is going to bomb because of the one shot that i right it's thinking about what is actually you know the reality and what are things that you can um that that you can control you know and i think having um having higher ups and having strong leaders who can lead by example you know is really helpful like we all have our own doubts and insecurities but that doesn't mean that everything you do must i be think that's also a great example of combating imposter syndrome that for a lot of us we just carry this constant doubt that we don't deserve to be here we're not smart enough we're not good enough um, psychologists termed imposter syndrome as this internal experience of intellectual phoniness, just this conviction that uh, we just don't have what it takes. And it's important to recognize that, yes, some of that comes from um, a number of things, right? Our upbringing, some of the beliefs we carry, some of the values we've been raised with, our own sense of self. A lot of us are uh, perfectionistic, high achievers. But it's also important to recognize that the industry that we might be working in could perpetuate those beliefs. Do I see other people that look like me? Do I see other women? Do I see other women of color? Am I constantly getting messages that I don't belong here? I'm not good enough. I don't deserve to be in position of decision making, of power, of leadership. Those messages have a huge impact and can perpetuate that phoniness yeah. feeling. And so, Caitlin, to hear you say, like, you know, you actually are challenging and dismantling those perspectives. Do I have what it takes? Do I have the credentials? Does my art speak for itself? All of these, all of this fact checking is so important in combating that really pervasive and in, in the, the insidiousness, honestly, of identity based oppression and discrimination in this work. Caitlin, you mentioned um, rituals before. Um, I'd love to hear um, maybe some materials that you're c consistent with that helps you deal with uh, pressure and, and stress stress with your with your career. Yeah. Um, so I have two dogs, and so a lot of my day, 
at least revolves around going outside twice a day. I think that's really helpful of just getting out of your surroundings and be in a new place, all right? Sometimes we'll do the short walk, sometimes we'll do the long walk, depending on, you know, how long of a break that we can take. But I think just getting out in nature is really helpful. Um, you know, there are little rituals that I do that, again, when I started, I thought they were really silly, but now, you know, they're just kind of key parts of my life. I think it's really important to set yourself up for small wins at the beginning of your day, right? I think that's the whole point about making your bed. It's not like you can to do it. We can all do it. But it's doing little things that like, hey, in, in one minute, I can have, I, I can see results in something. Oh, and then this and then that, right? Maybe I should go for a little jog before work, whatever it is. But just really setting yourself, you know, for, um, you know, to um, start your day off on a good foot. I think it's really important. Um, I, you know, I also try to find, basically, I'm always on the quest to find the most healthy thing that still tastes like candy. <laughs> so, you know, I found these. Um, yeah, so now my new thing is I found these um, apple cider vinegar gummies that just taste like gummy bears, right? So, right, I, I, you know, so that's kind of part of my snacks to try to figure out what other healthy snacks are out there, right? What things taste like Cheetos, but, you know, has the health benefit of other vegetables, right? That's kind of my little fun throughout there, like, oh, what new things, you know, are there, you know, to try? Um, but I always try to um, book in my days with um, listing 10 things that I'm, and that I'm grateful for. So practicing gratitude, wherever it is, um, and um, uh, meditating, right? I think I'm, this year, I'm up to, I think like a thousand minutes meditated on my head headspace app right so i want to keep that streak going or just doing a little you know as little as i can um yeah so those are some of my rituals currently yeah oh i'm also trying to use up all my skincare <laughs> so sometimes i'll just meditate i'll just throw something on right at least i'm doing right doing something i think gamifying it there's there's really something to be said for that like especially for for developing a good habit really to link it with something else that you already enjoy Let's say when you're doing, let's say for exercise, that's a common one that I think that people would like to do more often, but don't to pair it with watching your favorite TV show at the same time or your favorite podcast, and then only allowing yourself to listen to that podcast as you're jogging, for instance, or as you're going out for a walk to make it something that is more built in or just say, you know what, okay, I, I can only, or just using the skincare on it. Like the, the idea of I've got to finish the skincare routine makes you more likely to, act. there's an added benefit to doing it too, or seeing the high, sc the high score on your meditation app is also, or the apps often now sort of poke at you saying, you know, you haven't meditated today or something like, like you want to keep your several day streak going, you got to do it, which I actually think is, plays into human nature as well too, that I think a lot of us are more likely to stay consistent when we feel like there's there's that added gamification element to it as well. Um, I recently learned this about one of my kind of behaviors. So I love watching the show Friends, right? I have it, you know, like on the HBO, I have it in DVD form, I have a few episodes on my laptop, wherever it may be. And the my kind of recent aha moment, I learned that for people with high anxiety, it's really comforting to watch the same shows because you know what's coming up, right? And kind of having that same consistency. So like, I'm more mindful of that, but a lot of times, right, when I'm doing all these things or walking my dog, cleaning my apartments, right, I'll, I'll just throw on an episode of Friends, but also knowing that like, hey, I'm doing that probably because a lot of things in my day is giving me this high anxiety and I just really need a little... My, my comfort blanket of a show, right? I'll, I'll start something new the next day to kind of, you know, keep up with the VFX trends and, you know, see the works put out by my, you know, by my colleagues and so forth. But that's my little kind of fallback um, safety blanket as well. I wanted to, to, to do one last question uh, going into the other direction. So what can we do uh, when we see someone stressed, someone uh, who has an anxiety attack? What can we do as, as, as friends, colleagues, leaders of this person? What can we do to, uh, to help? And that's a good question. Um, you know, I think I'm sitting at a different place now, you know, being the head of my own company and being able to make these really, you know, high level decisions. Um, but I'm very conscious of checking in with any, with as many people individually as I can, right? This could be um, Zoom calls or just a simple, you know, text, you know, maybe we'll have our separate chain on Slack, whatever it is for me just to, you know, again, figuring out what's not being said, right? If someone just saying, oh, how are you? I'm fine. But physically, you can tell they're not fine. You can feel their heaviness. You can see that they're not, you know, kind of performing at their best. 
of you know just asking like hey do you have time for a couple of coffee right like can we take our next break together We're like oh you know i've seen this like what's something new that 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 you have seen what's something that has brought your joy recently i, I think asking these really smart um open-ended questions you know can really um get in kind of deeper and like what's going on um another tool that really turned me on in refining my language is this card game right again talking about gamification um it's this card game called we're not really strangers of just really asking better open-ended questions rather than how was your day you know right like what was something that was really stressful today, but made you feel really good after you completed, right? Something like that, that can just kind of get more concrete answers. I think um, the more that we know about someone, the more that we can kind of um, tweak our language, you know, to be more supportive and to be more helpful. I honestly, feel like I couldn't have said it much better than, than Caitlin. I think you covered it beautifully. Um, but really, the, the main thing is really just to be there for the person, to show that you're actually present. I think people are often afraid of saying the wrong thing. Will I offend them? Will, you know, will, will they even pull back even more because I even address the topic. But I think that people often, they, people just want to be seen, they want to be heard. So if you're actually coming from a place of concern and saying, I've, I've noticed that things seem a little different, or I just want you to know that I'm, I'm here for you, even if you don't want to talk about it, if I, I'm here, you know, whether it's for a phone call or something, sometimes just offering support in some way too, is, is really, it, it may make really the big difference for, for someone's day or for how they're doing at that moment too, because you can't necessarily assume that everyone has someone who will be listening to them, whether that's at work or friends outside of work. So to be that person is really something that we, we should all strive to be for the people around us, the people that we care about. I would also add that should anybody use language that concerns you, uh, making statements that they may not want to be here anymore or more direct statements about suicide, um, know that these approaches are useful in those interactions as well. As Melanie's saying, being authentic, uh, uh, being there, showing compassion and empathy, and also um, equipping yourself maybe with one or two resources. For instance, all of us have national suicide hotlines. Those are not only available for people who are in distress. They're also available for people who are seeking consultation or support like, oh my gosh, I have a friend and I think I might ask them uh, this question about their life. Um, calling that number and asking how to prepare oneself uh, and, and also knowing that resource makes that process even easier it, and, and know that it, it, it is never easy, but that even just asking that question in that very authentic way could provide support for that person and even prevent something harmful from happening. So it's so important to reach out. It's so important to take every statement seriously. Know that even jokes and humor could have an underlying meaning that someone is not in a good place. Uh, and of course, reach out to folks like us um, through various channels um, in, in order to equip yourself with the knowledge. Thank you very much. Um... Cam, do you would would you like to to sum us up uh, for this for this amazing chapter? What what are our key takeaways? Yes, um, thank you first, Caitlin, for sharing your story. I think there's a lot of great uh, takeaways and and things to leave with, um, considering that stress is is normal, right? Or anxiety is normal, and everyone deals with it uh, differently. Um, it's important to know that perhaps the first step is knowing or recognizing stress within yourself. And we can do that through uh, journaling, through meditation, through talking about it, um, through, uh, yeah, speaking with, it doesn't have to be professional, right? It could just be with a friend, but um, journaling is a great way just to be aware of thoughts or, or sitting with your thoughts through meditation is really important. Um, it's also uh, important to know how you cope with stress. What are some tools that work for you? Uh, what are some tools that you can try? Um, what are some boundaries you need to set to make sure that it helps you manage that stress and pressure? Um, Caitlin, you mentioned, you know, uh, your priorities and perhaps restructuring time commitments, right? I think stress and time definitely uh, work together. And if we're able to manage our time, then we're, we're better at managing our stress. Um, but I just I want to leave by saying that, you know, stress is normal. Everyone um, deals with it. it just, it's just about finding different ways to, to to manage it and get better at it. And don't be shy to ask for help. And don't forget to check in 
with others. So there are resources out there and I'm sure um, you'll be left with links at the end of this uh, webinar. And thank you, Melanie and Dr. Melanie and Dr. Jaya for, for your knowledge to the subject. It was really appreciated. E echoing Camille, thank you very much, uh, Caitlin, Dr. Jaya, Dr. Melanie. Um, it's, it's truly appreciated have, being, being part of this conversation. Uh, and thank you to our audience for, for watching. It's a very, very important topic within our industry and outside of our industry. Um, this is just one episode of, of, of a series. So please have a look out for the other episodes. Um, you will find them on the Visual Effects Society website, vfxmontreal.com. Uh, you will find it on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Thank you very much and see you soon.